Um, our next speaker is Rodrigo Reeves, who's going to talk about a, something that is different than the title in the program. He's going to talk about overall 40 millimeter laser monitoring program. Okay, thanks for those two very, uh, in, they were very inspiring talks, uh, very good deliveries. Um, I'm going to talk about our, first I would like to appreciate the opportunity to uh, present our work on, uh, on Blazer monitoring program with the OBRO 40 meter dish. So we're changing gears a little bit to um, single dish. And also um, it's wonderful to be here for this, uh, uh, for this uh, celebration of the 40th anniversary of the, of the um, publication that led to the uh, FR1, FR2 dichotomy. So thanks to Priti and, uh, and to the organizers for letting me speak today. Um, I'm coming from Chile, University of Concepcion. Um, so a little bit of uh, history here. Um, uh, before Fermi GST was launched, um, uh, the uh, director of the program, Tony Reedhead and, and colleagues, they decided that it was a good idea um, to start up a program on the 40 meter telescope in order to um, get uh, light curves that will eventually uh, be correlated with what the Fermi GST will produce in terms of data. Um, and so uh, before the, the Fermi was launched, then this program started with uh, um, funds from NASA and also internal funds. And um, what was interesting about it is that after uh, Fermi was launched and then uh, data from Fermi started came in, came out, uh, coming out, um, um, and, and the two sets of data started being uh, used uh, in parallel. Uh, then all the rest of other uh, high energy experiments like MAGIC, Veritas, HES also uh, began to get interest in the, in the um, overall 15 gigahertz light curves in order to uh, look for these uh, correlations between the radio and the gamma. So um, the impact of uh, this uh, very long-term light curves from, from uh, 15 gigahertz produced by OVRO has been, has been very, uh, uh, very deep. And also uh, in the future, there's CTA coming up and there's also then potential use for that, that data set as well. Um, so this is the collaboration here, um, the group of people that spread out uh, Europe, South America, and from Caltech, and also this collaboration is in partnership with uh, F Gamma, um, uh, led by uh, Tony Census, that is here and delivered the first talk, and his group. Uh, they contribute with uh, um, Effelsberg in multi wavelength mode, and also with uh, the 30 meter uh, telescope at IRAM, and also with data from Apex. So it's, it's very valuable. Um, here's a, a, a little bit of a laser emission model that we have seen uh, in the past few days. Um, so this is the uh, spectral energy distribution um, of uh, Markarian 421 that was published by Abdo et al. in 2011. Um, here we see uh, the two hump model, uh, where the first, first hump at the low, low energies is uh, produced by synchrotron emission um, uh, uh, from the jet uh, on this, uh, uh, and also in connection with these magnetic fields here. And uh, the high energy, I, I point out about the, the blanford levinson uh, emission model that's uh, um, it's been known to produce the external Compton component here for when the, um, uh, uh, from, sorry, from thermal uh, photons coming from the uh, inner, um, disk, um, and then they interact here with the shock uh, uh, at the parsec scale, and, and, and therefore produce gamma rays. Um, so you can fit this uh, one zone models or multi zone models to this uh, to this uh, SEDs, and you can actually do that uh, in different ways. You can actually fit other things there as well. <laughs> it's a Bactrian camel there, <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> So uh, the goals for our, our, our monitoring program are actually to determine the sites of the very high energy and gamma ray emission relative to the radio emission regions. 
So here uh, is, a, is a cartoon from a Walter Max Murbeck paper. Um, uh, and there are two zones here emitting. Here's the zone emitting the gamma ray. Uh, and far down the jet, we see the, the emission zone for the radio. And so there's connection there between the two. And uh, one thing that we're after is actually the, the, the distance, uh, if you will, in parsecs of these two emitting regions. We'll get a handle on that from our data. Um, so we also want to monitor all the bright quasars north of uh, declination minus 20, um, and the most studied AGN and microquasars biweekly. And also, of course, collaborate with the community on multiband characterization of displacer emission. Okay, so this is the 40 meter telescope at uh, Central California. Um, it's, a, it's a telescope that is 100% uh, dedicated for blazer monitoring. Um, it observes 1800 plus uh, sources bi-weekly. So it's a, it's a very high cadence long-term program that started in 2008. Uh, the catalog uh, started from sea grabs. Um, that was the initial sample. Uh, 1,100 sources, I think, and then it's been increasing. Um, uh, as, uh, um, it's been increasing with the catalogs from Fermi, actually one, two, and three catalogs, the Fermi catalogs, and also uh, sources detections by Veritas, Magic, and and Hess. Um, we've been using. Um, we have two epochs of data. Basically, the first one spanned from 2008 to 2014 with one total power receiver. Um, and then last year, we switched to a spectropolarimeter. So the idea there is to um, try to understand more about the magnetic field um, from the blazers and also rotations that we can actually get. And it's a spectropolarimeter, so we can get the very fine spectral resolution within an observing band that goes from 13 to 18 gigahertz. Um, OK. So this is just an example of uh, one of uh, uh, a Liker that we got uh, 2008. You see the time scale up here to 2014, um, and that's uh, intrinsic variability. Um, down here is a, it's a view in galactic. Uh, it's a, it's a map where our sources are located um, in galactic coordinates, and you see there's a hole there because uh, there there's a stationary um, satellite TV ring that actually uh, um, interferes with our observation and saturates our receiver. So uh, we try to avoid those. Um, that's another um, uh, light curve that we see uh, very strong uh, variability in the radio. Um, so on average here, we're on the order of a Jansky. And when it's flaring and it's reaching about six times the, same, the amplitude of the off state. So um, pretty large variability. Um, this is a, a, a variable uh, blazer as well, but uh, we, it's not showing very strong uh, flares compared to the, uh, to the long-term state. Um, we, uh, that's another one here, where you see very uh, well located in terms of time. This is uh, um, in a couple of weeks, you were uh, actually um, uh, more than doubling the, the flux that we were getting from this source. So this is the sort of uh, uh, light curves we're getting from this program. Uh, there, you, you see that down here and also on the previous one, um, you, they're, they're pretty well dominated by, 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 or they're characterized by red noise. You can feed the spectrum here, um, uh, take this and get the power spectral density, and you will see that you can feed that with a power law, and it will be very red. Uh, and we have to take that into account when we do the correlations with the other wave bands, like the, the gamma ray. Okay. So uh, we took our, our, our uh, data set and, and run a, a wavelet analysis through all the data set just to see if we could find interesting um, uh, um, events like uh, uh, extreme scattering events and stuff like that. And found this object. Um, uh, oops, sorry and found this object here. Um, we applied the um, wavelet transform with the Morley base and, and found a, a, a quasi-periodic oscillation uh, with a period of 120 to 150 days. Here, this is a periodogram. Uh, that's the light curve, and that, that's the same light curve there. But uh, um, the, the period 
of the, of the oscillation here is um, deviating a little bit, as you can see from the, the peak of the, of the periodogram. Um, the significance of this uh, um, periods were evaluated uh, using, using the power law. Uh, I mean, the, 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 the PSD was extracted from this source and then uh, was extracted from this source and then um, um, uh, through Monte Carlo analysis, um, uh, many light curves were generated with the same uh, power law then. And then the significance of getting this such um, um, oscillation uh, or, or periods uh, was evaluated and found that we were like, getting this at a 2.8 uh, sigma uh, significance. Um, so if we, if we correlate then the radio light curves with the, with the uh, gamma ray light curves from Fermi, um, uh, here's uh, one example. Uh, There's the, the radian at the gamma. Uh, we see um, you, we need to treat this very carefully, as I said, because of the of the red noise uh, um, uh, uh, characteristic. Um, uh, in in other light curves, uh, you get the ver more variability on the gamma and and also uh, other flares from the radio, and then. You, it is difficult to actually line up what's, what's correlating with what. So the statistical analysis has to be very uh, careful. Um, and so again here, based on uh, power spectral density and also through uh, Monte Carlo analysis, um, the, the light curves here and the, uh, are, uh, the correlation, sorry, the, the cross correlation function result from this was evaluated in terms of significance through this uh, uh, Monte Carlo analysis. And you see here the, the red is the one sigma uh, significance of the, of the correlation. Um, uh, orange is two sigma and green is three sigma. Um, so with, with this, um, we see that actually uh, the delay between the, the radio and the gamma ray, um, it's, a, it's a broad uh, function, it's a, it's a broad result. Where we can connect physically then these two highly significant results here in order to try and find out what's the actual distance in parsecs between the radio emission and the, and the gamma ray emission. And for this particular source, uh, the, 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 the result was uh, uh, 37 days and 8 days uh, for these two uh, particular um, um, extremes. Um, of course, being that one, the, the most significant with eight days um, of delay. Uh, sorry, eight parsecs, sorry. Sorry, I got confused. No, this is distance in parsecs, sorry. Um, so uh, if, if we take all this uh, um, um, or a similar analysis to many, many uh, light curves that uh, we got and also correlations with Fermi data, uh, we can um, stack all those results in order to get the, a better or high, higher significance in, in the actual delay between the, two, um, between the two events, between the two flares. And uh, so if we did that stacking here, and, and this is the result. Uh, so uh, for the most of it, the radio lags the gamma ray, and, um, and this is shown here. Um, uh, another thing that the group has, has worked on uh, and, and, and actually, Tony Sensus showed this, uh, this plot. This is from a paper of uh, Lars Furman from his group. Uh, you see that uh, the correlation of the, uh, um, of the, of the F gamma um, light curves that are spanning from 110 to actually 0.8 millimeters in wavelength, um, uh, the, the, the lags between uh, the gamma ray and the radio, actually, they deviate as you increase the frequency, as uh, you might expect as a signature of synchrotron self-absorption. And that's actually, uh, from this plot here, you will see that the peaks are actually deviating where that's zero, right? And lag, positive lags are uh, radio uh, lagging uh, gamma ray. And, and in this plot, that, that information from here is transferred and you see uh, the actual lags uh, increasing as you go down in frequency. That's a very, uh, so, uh, as a, and it, just to sh briefly show an impact of uh, the, the uh, 40 meter program um, in, in terms of uh, publications, here's what 
has been published from 2014 to 2015. Um, and it gets uh, very uh, interesting. It has been uh, over 70 referee papers published so far since the beginning of the, uh, of the program. Uh, over the last 15 um, or, or year and a half, it's been 30, so it's about two papers per, per month. Uh, so just want to show uh, my summary is um, we've been working with a high cadence uh, and delivering a high cadence uh, more than seven year data set that is totally available to the public. You can actually go into this website and, and, and put in a request for the data. You can download it directly and get in touch with the people there. Um, the statistical approach deals with the red noise problem. That is a, it's a, it's a big one for radio gamma correlation um, and the significance level of physically meaningful. Um, the demonstration, uh, we demonstrate that the radio flares are lagging, the gamma ray flares, um, and, 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 that, uh, and, and the, the significance of that and also from the other analysis will improve dramatically when we increase the time base because uh, then the PSD will get very constrained and then you will be able to uh, calculate the, 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 the errors and significance much better. And then blazer spectral polarimetry is coming very soon uh, as we collect data. So with that, I'll, I'll stop. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Rodrigo. Okay, have we got some questions? Um, I think this may actually be a question for Anton rather than you, but um, it, it, because it relates to the F-gamma results. Um, am I correct in thinking that when you go to the highest frequencies, um, that, the, that the lag becomes essentially zero? Um, or, or rather, yes, in that plot, um, it, the asymptotic thing, I mean, it, it, it's sort of almost but not quite consistent with zero. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, do you think that the... the the lag is still significant at 0.8 millimeters? No, it, it might not be. Um, uh, I think uh, what is more um, significant about this plot is actually the drop, like the, 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 the drop with frequency, but the actual uh, offset there, I, I don't think that that is, uh, um, that is very meaningful. I don't know if you, Tony, you have a, no, yeah. There's nothing. Would you agree with that, Tony? Yeah. yeah. I mean, it, a lot depends on that last point. If that last point can actually be yeah. Um, yeah. pinned down, you could actually... Robert, can I answer your question? I, I'm here. Oh, yeah. oh. Over there, yeah. on the top. Yeah. So, uh, you asked about, like, what, what kind of, like, if you go to higher and higher frequency, do we see time lags between high energy and uh, radio light curves? Is that what you wanted to know? So the answer is that uh, that depends upon uh, the shock strength and its evolution. So the key idea here is that let's say the shock reaches its maximum development uh, around 100 gigahertz. Uh, then for the frequencies above 100 gigahertz, uh, theoretically you don't expect to see uh, time lags between high energy and gamma ray light curves and radio light curves. Uh, and this has uh, been studied at least for few flares and few sources. For example, I have studied for a source, like for the, uh, if you take a look at the spectrum of the source and if you see the peak frequency and you can clearly um, see that uh, for the frequencies above the peak frequency, uh, you don't see any time lag and for the frequencies below that, uh, you do see time lag. In addition to that, we, what we find was quite interesting is that if you extrapolate this time lag uh, versus uh, frequency plot to higher frequencies, for us what we find is that the slope uh, goes until optical, and uh, so there is always a delay between optical and radio, and then there was no delay between uh, optical and gamma ray bands. Uh, so the key point here is that, uh, I mean, sh the source was still at optical, uh, still optically thick at that frequencies uh, until optical bands. So we, we see this kind of slope. So, but let's say the shock uh, reached its maximum development around 50 or 100 gigahertz, then all the frequencies above that will be in optically thin region, and you don't expect to see any time lag. But of course, there, if there are more uh, things involved than that, then uh, the situation may be complicated. Thank you, Bindu. You have uh, one last quick question. Okay, I have a last quick question. Um, I'm, I'm eager to see the, the spectral polarimetry results coming out. You'll be able to actually get the radio spectra 
simultaneous with polarization data. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is that working well? Uh, <laughs> I, mean, as, I mean, depends on him. What, what a horrible question <laughs> to ask. We're, we're working on it. Uh, okay. Yeah, we're studying the calibration process, so um, I think we'll we'll be able to uh, publish something maybe online um, for the winter. I mean. Okay, like, we'll look. Uh, thank you very yeah. much. Yeah, we'll look forward to that. Sure. Okay. Um